He doesn't give you all of that. He, he doesn't tell you that the, the satisfying taste of sin and disobedience will soon be replaced with the bitter taste of regret and consequence. Yeah, the day. 
touched us so far in this service to God. We thank you for the praise and worship that has already gone forth. We ask the Heavenly Father that the conditions of our heart are processed, that we're ready to receive the word that you have for us on this, this morning, that you would be with us as we hear and, and listen and, and soak it in, dear Heavenly Father, that you would help us to change and make whatever uh, adjustments is necessary to continue the work that you've started in us. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. So turn with me again. We're going to start in uh, Ephesians, the sixth chapter. Ephesians, the sixth chapter, verses 10 and 11. We've read this and we have been looking at these particular verses over the last several, uh, several weeks. Verse 10 says this, a final word. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's, God's armor so you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. And so the title of today's message is The Strategies of the Enemy. The Strategy of the Enemy. We talked about this briefly before, but when a coach prepares his or her team to compete in an upcoming game or, or match, they, they, they give the team three things. Number one, they give the game plan. Number two, they provide the playbook. And then number three, they give the scouting report. And so today we're going to talk about the scouting report or as Paul puts it in, in, in verse 11, the strategy of the devil. Because listen, if we are to win, if we're to win in life as God intends for us to win, it's critical, it's absolutely vital that you understand the tactics and the schemes that Satan uses when he attacks God's people. Look at what Paul writes in 2 Corinthians, the, the uh, second chapter, verses 11. It says this, In order that Satan may not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. And then in other translations, in, 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 it, in the ESV, for example, it says, for the latter part says, For we are not ignorant of his designs. One of the major keys to victory in our lives is to and, and we often overlook this 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 key, but the major key is is to understand the traps that the enemy uses to trip us up. We 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 sometimes don't know how he's going to attack us. We we are ignorant of his designs, ignorant of his schemes, and we can't be if we're going to win. You got to know what's. What the scouting report says. And so let's look at some of the strategies, just a, just a couple of the strategies that the enemy uses uh, against us. So turn to uh, John, the 8th chapter, verse 44. And on this particular occasion, Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees. And he makes a statement about them and about Satan. Verse 44 says this, For you are the children of your father, the devil, and you love to do the evil things he does. He was a murderer from the beginning. He has always hated tr the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, it is consistent with his character. Some translations say, when he speaks, he speaks his native language. When he lies, he speaks his native language. 
And the Bible continues, Jesus says, For he is a liar and the father of lies. <coughs> so we need to know this. The first strategy we need to know is our enemy, Satan, is a liar. He's a liar. Lying is who he is and it's what he does. So I want you to take a, a, a moment to really think about what we're saying here. Think about the truth of that statement. The enemy is a liar. Knowing this about the enemy, can, it, it can have an incredible impact on how you live your life because it will affect what you believe. It will affect what you believe. Have you ever met a person who was just a liar? Just a liar. Everybody knew it. Everything that they said that came out of their mouth, you knew was going to be fabricated. Just putting it nicely. You knew it was going to be a lie. Do, 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 we, do we know people like that? It, 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 you, you knew that what they were going to say was, was a lie. You were going to question everything that they told you. Everything they said was met with suspicion because they are a liar. You would make decisions based on what this person tells you because they are a liar. If they came with you with this, this, this incredible story of what they did, what they see, you wouldn't believe it because they are a liar. We may know people like that. We may, we may know people that, that they, they just indulge in taking the liberty to uh, uh, exasperate the, 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 the story. Mm -hmm. It would be foolish of you to take advice, to make decisions based on somebody who is a liar. It, it would be foolish to get stirred up. They come into the room and, and, and they're like, guess what? When I saw such and such and so and so, guess what they did? Guess, guess what they said about you? It would be foolish of us to get stirred up and ready to fight based on the word of a liar. It would be foolish to lash out in anger and make decisions based on your friend, the liar. So, so Jesus, who is truth, that's who he is. He is truth. Jesus calls Satan a liar and the father of lies. And yet we get stirred up, lash out in anger, and make decisions based on the misinformation that comes straight from the devil and his army. <clears throat> but he's a liar. Everything that he, he, he tells us is false. That's, 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 that's part of his strategy. He's not going to tell you the, the, the truth. And if he does uh, tell you a bit of the truth, it's going to be... Uh, it's going to be half of the truth. It's going to be half the truth. He's not going to tell you all the information, and we'll see that in a, in a, in a second. But you need to know that he's a liar. Don't believe the lie. Don't get caught up when, when, when he tells you various things about you that, go, that are contrary to the word of God. He's a liar. That's who he is. That's what he does. And we need to get that. So we, we can stop basing decisions 
and acting on something that the enemy, the liar, whispers and suggests that we do. He's a liar. Not only is he the father of lies, the second thing I want to point out to you is our enemy, he is a master, he's the master of deception and manipulation. He's the master of deception and manipulation. So when you, when you examine the conversation between the serpent and Eve in the garden, we can see a major strategy that the enemy still uses today, how he manipulates and he's very deceptive. So let's, let's kind of look at that, that, that scripture. And we're going to look at Genesis, the third chapter, verses 1. The Bible says the serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals, and the Lord had... The, the serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord had made. One day he asked the woman, Did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Well, let's look what God said. Because the, Satan, the, the, the enemy comes and he says, Did God really say you must not eat the fruit? Well, let's look what, what God says in in. One verse back in Genesis 2, verses 15 through 17, the Bible says this, The Lord God placed the man in the garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. But the Lord God warned him, You may freely eat the fruit of every tree in the garden, except the tree of knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. When you look at what God said and what Satan says that God said, you'll find a, sub, a subtle but very profound difference. The first thing that comes out of God's mouth when he warns, when he gives a warning to the man, is he says, you may eat freely you may freely eat the fruit. That's what God says. You may freely eat the fruit. The first thing out of Satan's mouth, when he was accusing God of what God said, he said, you must not eat. So I want, I want you to know the, and, and understand the emphasis. Because God's emphasis is on freedom. Because God said you may freely eat the fruit. God's emphasis for them was on the freedom that they have. The enemy's emphasis is on restriction. You must not eat. It's a big difference. That's a big difference. So here's the strategy. The enemy convinces people, including many believers. He convinces us that God is all about restriction and limitation and, and, and not freedom and liberty. I mean, think about that. As we were growing up, we, we you know, some people were growing up in the churches and in a lot of churches, they, they always list what you can't do. There's a list of things that you can't do. Restrictions. And, but when God gives us, and when, when God gave the man the, the instructions, he emphasizes freedom. He emphasizes freedom. Satan is the one who has, who has restrictions. And the enemy and his army, they've done a masterful job of propagating this lie that God is all about restrictions and limitations. What I'm going to show you here is actually the reverse. It's actually the opposite. So let's continue. Let's finish the conversation. Back in chapter 3, verses 2, this is, this is the woman talking. 
Of course, we may eat. We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said, you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. Let me pause right there. Did God say anything about touching it? He didn't say anything about touching it, right? Be careful what you get second hand. <laughs> Be careful about what you get, the, the messages that you get secondhand. Because remember, God gave the message. He gave the instructions to the man. Verse 15, 16, and 17. The woman was not created until verse 21. So it was a man's responsibility to communicate to the woman what God said. And somewhere in the translation, she, she added that. She said that God said that God said if you if you uh, you must not eat or even touch it. If you do, you will die. Verse 4 then says, you won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. So the serpent tells the woman, you won't die. God doesn't want you to, to be like him. God doesn't want any peers. God just wants to keep you as his subjects. God is restricting and limiting your potential. He doesn't want you to experience all, all the good things in life. You may be able to experience some of the good things. But God is limiting and restricting you from experiencing all of the good things in life. That's a lie from the, that's, 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 what he, that's what he's doing. The, 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 this fruit, the temptation that he's presenting to her, he's saying this fruit is good. You won't die. Go ahead and eat. I'm telling you, this is the same thing that he's doing with us today. It's the same thing that he's doing with us today. Then verse 6 says, the woman was convinced. Because remember, he's a master deceiver and manipulator. And he, he, he's trying to convince us that God is all about restriction. But all throughout the Bible, he talks about that we're free. We're free from bonds. We're free from, from, from the, the penalty of sin. We are free. Amen. Yes. But the enemy, he turns that thing around. And the Bible says the woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious. And she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some, of, some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it too. Now look at this, verse 7. At that moment, their eyes were open, and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. Here's another trap. Here's another strategy of the enemy. Number three. He promises freedom, but delivers bondage. He promises freedom, but delivers bondage. Because he is a liar, he's a deceiver. He's the master manipulator. He will never tell you the whole truth. Nowhere in the conversation with the woman, nowhere in the conversation did Satan, the serpent, talk about the shame and the nakedness that, that, that she and her husband would experience immediately after their disobedience. He doesn't give you all of that. He doesn't tell you 
that the, the satisfying taste of sin and disobedience will soon be replaced with the bitter taste of regret and consequence. He doesn't tell you that. That's not a part of the conversation. He's just, he's just dangling what looks good, the temptation. That's what he's dangling before you. And he's already convinced us that God is all about restriction. And certainly if this thing was so good, why would God, why would he limit us? Why would God put up that restriction for something that's so good? Then he convinces us. And then we are indulging into sinful practices. And then comes the regret, the consequence, the shame, the despair that we feel. See, he's not, he's not telling you. He's just promising freedom without restriction. That's what the enemy is promising. And that appeals to our flesh. Everybody, everybody, most, most people in here, when you were in high school, you probably said a time or two that you can't wait to get out on your own. When I get out on my own, nobody is going to be able to tell me what I can do. This thing starts, it's, it starts early. Just, just you wanting your freedom and wanting your independence and wanting to do your own thing. And so the enemy comes by and he, 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 he dangles freedom before you. Because it's already in you, you can't wait to get out and do your thing. You take the bait. But he didn't tell you the whole story. How many times, don't, don't, you don't have to raise your hand or anything, but how many people have it, have done something in their lives? And it was good while you were doing it. And then comes the morning after. And you're stuck, which is you and your thoughts, and the shame and guilt and regret from what you did. And you were having fun when you was doing it. Because that's what the enemy promised. Freedom and fun. But he doesn't say the shame and the nakedness that comes along with it. The guilt, the sorrow, the despair, the literal hangover. The trouble that you can get into as you go along your merry little way. He doesn't talk about that. He, he, he doesn't tell you that. He doesn't tell you that if you buy into the lie and you pick up what he's throwing down. He doesn't tell you that it can literally cost your life. <clears throat> Physically, and spiritually. Because the wages of sin is death. There is a way that seems right to a person, but it ends up in death. Spiritual separation from God. He promises you freedom, but he delivers bondage. So, so, there we have it. some of the strategies that the, that the enemy uses. He's a liar. J just as the character of God is love, the character of the enemy who's attacking you is lying. That's what he does. That's who he is. So, so, so when he says to you, 
You're not good enough. When he says to you, God could never love someone like you. When he says you'll never amount to anything, you're worthless. When he says that heaven is not real. When he says that it's too hard to live this Christian life. When, when, when he says all of these things and, and, and he, he, he suggests these things into your mind and, 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 and he's telling you all of these things, don't believe the lie. Don't believe the lie. Because he is a liar. He's a liar. And then he, he, he plants those seeds into our minds. Because number two, he's a master of deception and manipulation. But he never discloses what might be waiting for you after you're done doing what you will be and bad and free enough to do. He never tells you what comes next. And finally, always remember that he promises freedom but delivers bondage. He delivers bondage. If you belong to Jesus, you can't just do anything that you want to do. You can't just go any place you want to go. You can't just say anything that you want to say. You can't watch anything that you want to watch. If you belong to Jesus. And, 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 and those restrictions that God has outlined that the Holy Spirit tries to keep you from, it really, it, th th those restrictions are there to magnify the freedom that you have. This is what I mean. If you don't, if you don't get upset and handle something in the wrong way, Because sometimes, you know, things happen. But if you get upset and you don't handle things in the wrong way, you don't, in other words, let me just make it plain, you don't get so, so, so outside your mind that you go and cuss somebody out. Because that's, that's, that's that's, that would be a restriction. We, we, we ought not do that. Blessings and curses ought not come out of the same, the same mouth, right? So the Bible restricts us from, from, from cussing somebody out, right? If you abide by that, restriction, then you are free from the guilt that comes if you otherwise indulge. <coughs> you're, you're, you're free from the consequences that, that could happen if you, if you give somebody a piece of your mind. So those things are, are set up in our lives to magnify the freedom that Jesus died to give us. But as a believer, you can't do you, you can't do everything that, that, you, that you want to do. If we are to win as God intended for us to win, we have to know the strategy of the enemy so we are not ignorant of his schemes and his design for us. Amen. Amen.
friends to know you, Lord, to live with the touch of your hand, stronger each day. Show me your way. with the help of the Holy Spirit, you won't give him an opportunity to even to even go there. Just don't go there. Because he's going to give you, he's going to offer you the world. But it's at a price. And the price is he will deliver. Bondage. So let's think about that this week. As we go through it, I don't know what's going to happen this week. I pray that everything goes well for, for us. But just keep that in mind. Amen? Let's stand. Lord God, we thank you for the word that's gone forth today. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be familiar with the strategies of the enemy. So that we're not, so that we're not ignorant of his devices, of his designs of his many attempts to trip us up. Help us to rely on your Holy Spirit. Help us to hear him. Help us then to listen to him and obey and do what he has for us to do. In Jesus' name. Now, Lord, as we leave this place but never your presence, please go with us. Please be with us. And please help us through this week until we have an opportunity to, to meet again. In Jesus' name, amen.